G'day, Greg. Welcome to the Ultimate Youth Worker podcast. Thank you very much, Aaron. It's good to be here. Thanks for asking us to um, be, a, be a part of this in your Pleasure. Ultimate Youth Worker. Thank you Pleasure. very much. <laughs> uh, so uh, I've known Greg for a couple of years now and uh, Greg is involved with a mob called Mahana Culture. Greg, can you tell us a little bit about Mahana and, and what it is that you guys do? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we, um, Mahana is a Polynesian word, um, but specifically we use it from the Samoan or Samoan. I have that in my cultural tale as part of my heritage um, on my mother's side. So Mahana... Uh, literally means bring into the light. Um, in other parts of the Pacific, it's called it's a word that's used for warmth or heat. Um, so it's this idea of bringing things into the light. That's how we use it as Mahana culture. Um, so really, it's the idea of bringing our culture, my culture, your culture, the culture out there, and shining light on it. Really having a look at it, and hopefully it warms us. <laughs> yeah, um, I like the idea of warmth. Um, that uh, when we uh, connect with each other there's a warmth about us so, yes. um, so we're primarily um, about the idea of awakening cultural dignity um, in each other in yourself um, in your workplace uh, with the clients you're working with um, it's all about dignity um, but for us it's about not just your emotional dignity your personal dignity as well as that is a, is the culture the things that have influenced us on our journey to where we are now, we need to give that dignity too. Um, we need to give that a, a chance to, to look at it and connect with it and own it. Um, and maybe not own some things that are not so great about our culture mm. as well. Um, so we're about bringing light to that. And we do that through the idea of cultural intelligence. So uh, we believe to be culturally aware, to be culturally competent or to be culturally responsive. Um, those are all sort of buzzwords in the idea of inclusion and diversity. Um, we believe you need a foundation of cultural intelligence or CQ. Um, and so our biggest, um, I suppose, biggest aim is to get people and groups and individuals to be culturally intelligent so that they can be culturally competent and culturally responsive. Um, because we want, you know, we all want good results for our young people. We want good, healthy communities um, and we need to create culture, good culture. Um, and so that's what we're on about, bringing dignity uh, through um, uh, through yeah culture and we we believe having a strong foundation of cultural intelligence in the same way as we work in our iq our intellectual intelligence um, we also now know we need to work on our emotional intelligence our eq um, you also now i think uh, which has always been there a culture so we think we need to be culturally intelligent when you have all three of those things going on boy you have a really really good youth worker social worker community worker Uncle, auntie, mum, dad. <laughs> if, you can, if you can have all those things going on, yeah. uh, you've got a better chance of creating better relationships, um, more diversity, uh, inclusion, and belonging. And for me, when you create belonging, people feel dignity. Yes. All those I things. couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And I think uh, for all too long, we, we've focused, uh, at least in, in youth work training settings, on uh, building up that... Uh, IQ, the intellectual side of things, understanding theory and, uh, mm -hmm. and all that type of thing. We, we've worked on uh, our empathy skills. We've worked on our EQ. We, we've worked on how do we uh, understand the emotional side? How do we understand um, people's feelings if, if yeah. we want to get all touchy-feely? Uh, but uh, that, that cultural intelligence, that cultural competency side of things, yeah. whilst we've talked about it for probably a good 15 years or so now in um, Australian youth work, at least it, it's been a slow one for us to, to fully yeah. uh, grasp. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think, and I think it's because, and there is some fairly strong evidence out there in research that shows that a lot of cultural competency training just hasn't worked. I mean, the very question, the very reason why you've asked that for 15 years, we've tried this and you're saying we're trying it. Well, yeah. we should have, if it was right, we would have solved it. Yes. <laughs> um, from our point of view, we believe you need to be culturally intelligent to be able to be culturally competent. Yes. Uh, cultural intelligence starts with the why we do this um, and, the, and the hows and the whens. Um, and cultural, cultural competency tends to just be what's, what you don't do and do. And it's actually about the other. Whereas for us, cultural intelligence starts with us. It starts mm. with me owning my own cultural tale 
or my own culture so that I can actually be curious about someone else's. Yeah. Um, because it is, I mean, if you just look at it as a relationship, why would I want to know someone else if they're not willing to be vulnerable or know themselves? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a sure. pretty simple kind of logic. Um, so you can just add that into culture. Well, if you don't have a culture, then someone who is of another culture who's very strong in their culture, why would they share their culture with you if you say you don't have one? Yes. Or if you don't dignify your own. If you can't dignify yourself, then it's pretty difficult to dignify someone else mm. if you follow the logic. So, Definitely. Yeah, so we do that in emotional intelligence or empathy. Show empathy to yourself, show care for yourself. And that actually does then open up the space in between for someone else to be vulnerable and to show dignity. Yes, that's around, that's around our emotions. Well, let's just add culture. There's another layer to that. Yeah. Um, if I want to know your culture, well, what can I share? That's that, my culture. It, it's a really great framework. Uh, a lot of the cultural competency training that I've done over over almost 20 years in, in youth work has, has kind of fallen into one of two categories for me. It's, it's either been othering, so yeah. you are other to this person. Um, yeah. and, and that, that always leaves you feeling kind of let down or that there's, there's barriers and I'll never be able to, to, to get in, into yeah. uh, being with this person. Uh, or it's, it's been, um, it's been all about me and my, my culture and my understanding, which yeah. then leaves no opportunity for finding out about other, uh, cultures. And, uh, when I came across uh, Mahana's work uh, a couple of years ago now, um, the, the training was, was so different to anything that, that I'd uh, sat in. And, and I think it is very much because of, of that understanding of, of cultural intelligence. And, yeah. and uh, as, as you said, uh, having, having the ability to, to build some cultural dignity so that we can uh, understand our culture, but then be very curious about other people's culture. And I think um, the training that, that I've sat through uh, for, for cultural competency trainings, and, and there's lots out there, there's, there's yeah, heaps right. out there now, right. um, ha has often let me, um, left me, sorry, um, not being curious anymore uh, because I'm feeling dejected from having done the training. So um, in that, that spirit of curiosity, let's, mm -hmm. um, let's share some culture together. So can, can you tell yeah, us sure. a little bit about yeah, your sure. culture? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, just, so just quickly, you did ask me what we did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what we do is we actually run, we run a, a, we run a course, a two day course called the lens course. And the idea of looking at your own culture first before we look at others. So the, it's a two-day course that we run. Uh, we also have a, we've created a thing called the, um, the Therapeutic Cultural Discovery Tool, which actually helps youth workers and social workers actually help uh, young people find their culture, go through the trauma of that. Right. Um, and, um, well, face some traumas around that. And then, but hopefully come out integrating their, all their cultural tales, all their stories. Um, and so we have a one day workshop on how to use that tool. Uh, we do also partner with organizations and look at their structures um, and their entire systems um, of, of uh, how they're working culturally. Uh, so that, yeah, so go to our website, you'll see there there's a bunch of things that we can and can and do. We'll, we'll put all those details on the, on the um, website guys so yeah. that you can see them and you, you'll be able to track along and, and follow the work that Mahana has been doing. Mm. So yeah, Aaron, you asked me to, I suppose, uh, one of the core, I suppose, core frameworks um, and, and probably the one we start with is this idea of your, of um, engaging and exploring what we call our cultural tale. Um, and I first came across this beautiful proverb, which comes from Native America. Um, uh, I'm called Martin Brokenleg, who's a Sioux Indian, Sioux Nation chief. Um, actually is also a psychologist, particularly works in the area of uh, child sex abuse um, and lives now in Vancouver. He taught me this little proverb, this little quote, and he says that we all drag a cultural tale a thousand years long. We all drag a cultural tale a thousand years long. Now, tale is spelled T-A-L-E. So it's story. We all drag a cultural story a thousand years long. And this is how he taught it to me. He said, in Native American cultures, um, and this is where, you know, it's a real gift that he's given us to actually 
um, uh, use this as a pedagogy or, or a way. This is what's so great about having lots of different curiosity about other cultures is they can give us so many different truths. So this isn't appropriation. This is actually adding to it. That's how he sees it. Um, is that it actually can add something to our uh, already vast IQ, uh, vast knowledge yes. of theories, that this is just another one, which is beautiful. And this is how he taught me this particular proverb. He says, in Native American culture, particularly in the Sioux Nation, they, they think about things in seven generations. So when, they make, when you are trying to make a decision now in the present, where you are right now in 2020, as a, to me, a 50-year-old in 2020, they say to make a good decision for the future, we need to look back seven generations into the past and possibly ask how our ancestors, our grandparents, our great grandparents actually made the similar decision. So then we can actually have, you know, all our ancestors' voices telling us how we should do things now. Because whatever decision we make now, we actually, that decision will impact seven generations into the future. Mm. And so when we pass on whatever decisions and things we need to think about, good and bad, we are actually passing on to the next seven generations. And you know what, Yeah, and I added that up and you know, average lifespan is 70, 75 for Native American people. That's about a thousand years. Yep. <laughs> so they're about accurate. So when we think about dragging a cultural tale a thousand years long, it's not just behind you. It's actually what stories are we passing on to the next generation? So when we say about our cultural tale, we're actually talking about not just our past, but also our present and our future. And so one of the things we do at Mahana is we use that as this beautiful gift from my uncle Martin to as a learning tool for people in a journey to go on. And so also in Māori, I'm from New Zealand. That's where I was born, even though my, uh, my, my mother and father, which I'll talk to in a minute, from other countries, but I was born in New Zealand. So I had the privilege of also being brought up to allow the Māori people or being taught by the Māori people, the indigenous people of New Zealand. Um, and they have this great quote called Kamura Kamuri, which means walking uh, forward, looking backwards. So it's a similar concept. And it's interesting how can, they're- Can you just say that again? What, yeah. what, 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 what's it called? Ka, kamuri Kamuri, which basically yeah. means walking forward, looking backwards, that kind of idea. So it's a similar concept how in New Zealand, they had a similar company, Native American, <laughs> you know, had a similar concept. It's interesting how those universal mm -hmm. truths or universal wisdom is there. And so I grew up thinking that too, in my own, particularly in my mother's culture. Um, if you look behind me, you'll see a woven mat. Um, and that just looks like a mat that puts on the floor. But for us in the Pacific, uh, every weave is actually a person. So when you put them together like that, every person has a story. Yeah. When we sit on our mats, we actually are sitting on our ancestors. And when we sit on our mats, that's where we ponder what we're going to do next. So we're sitting on the ancestors, drawing on their knowledge to make decisions for the future. So you can see how in lots of different cultures, we actually had a similar concept. You'll also see just next to me, the tartan. This is, my, mm -hmm. this is actually my uh, Scottish tartan. And it comes from, even though my name is Morris, my clan is Buchanan. And it's very interesting that they use weaving as well. Mm. <laughs> that in Scotland, the weave actually tells you something about our story. So, uh, so in all parts of the world, with West, Eastern, whatever, we have these story, we have this kind of concept and wisdom about stories and how they should inform our identity. Yes, and that's what we do. So, what we do is we say, first thing you, if you ever do our course and come with us, the first thing we get you to do is actually to explore your cultural tale, go and engage it. Go and embrace it, good and bad. Yeah. The colonized bit to decolonize. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to celebrate the things that, you know, that have been great, but also to look at the things that haven't been so great. And how do we redeem that? How do we heal it? How do we reject it if we need to? Or how do we embrace it? So we have we have a very simple, very simple kind of framework, catchy kind of three words. And we we connect our cultural tale through three ways. We don't get technical in anthropology. We try to make it simple. <laughs> I said that, eh? He said, if you can't explain a theory to a seven or 12 year old, then it's probably not a theory worth kind of holding on Explaining, onto. yeah. Exactly. So let's make it as simple as, because culture is very, very, very complex and it can be very confusing about what culture is. And there are default understandings to culture that we need to actually 
get past and get over. And often culture is just something that your mum and dad did mm. or it's blood or heritage that's been passed on. And that is true. That, that is absolutely mm. true. But if to think that that's the only thing that culture is, is incredibly narrow mm. and one dimensional. It's not even two dimensional, <laughs> it's one dimensional. Um, because there are so many things that make up um, our story. And it's not just your mum and dad. Yeah. And, and uh, so whether your mum and dad have actually passed on your culture well, if you're from a culture that actually, that, that's been embedded into you, you knew your language, your food, all those things, or cultures that have just been, your tail has literally been chopped off, where parents yeah. haven't passed on anything or don't even celebrate who they are. We have to analyze them and we have to embrace them. So we have these three sure. very, very three simple kind of things. We said, we explore your cultural tale through blood, birth, and choice. Now, let me explain those things. Blood. Blood, it sounds rather gory, <laughs> but blood is literally through your heritage. Mum and dad. I mean, you know, everyone's been born to someone down the track. Uh, you've been brought up in a house somewhere. Um, so it's through your blood, your mum and dad. So what food did you eat? You know, what language did they speak? Uh, what music did they play when you were a kid? What movies did you watch with them? Um, those sorts of things. What, you know, what, what language did they pass down? You know, sayings or whatever, proverbs, what sort of things. Yeah. Um, then also, so that's your, literally your heritage. So that's the one, that's another one within blood. So your heritage, mm -hmm. explore that. Get onto ancestral.com. You know, get, get to know where they've come from. Because that actually then tells you the history. So if you say... They, uh, you know, you drag a cultural tale a thousand years long. Well, seven generations past, no one who is an Indigenous Australian yep. <laughs> has had some sort of culture somewhere else. So go and explore that. You know, I know that's not easy for some people, but I encourage people to do it, even yes. though it might be good or bad. You'll find something possibly really beautiful, but you also might find something that's not so great. But actually yes. quite often... When something's not so great, that intergenerational trauma that we've talked about, that people know about, well, it wouldn't it be good to know what that actually is mm. as opposed to just be affected by it, you know, in a negative way. You know, we don't actually know how to engage trauma unless we actually lean into it and look at it. Um, so we need to look back. So, for example, you know, in my cultural tale, uh, my, my, um, my mother is Samoan or Samoan. Uh, from the Pacific Islands. Uh, my father is Scottish. I uh, was born in New Zealand, but my grandparents were born in Scotland. Um, and they were migrants. Um, and if I go back to my, uh, to my mother's side, mother, Samoa was colonized by Germany mm -hmm. and was, um, you know, was all went through the process of colonization. Language was stripped, all those things. So that has an impact on who I am. <laughs> Um, you know, so uh, I went back and explored those things about what what went on in Samoa at the time of the last centuries, and also back to Scotland. I I know my tale goes back as far as William Wallace in Scotland, um, and we were invaded, <laughs> the Scots. So there's a whole thing around colonisation that I learned there. That actually both sides of my cultural tale, mum and dad, had colonisation going on. Yes, and pain. You know. So, but also we were, we, were, we were shared beautiful parts of our culture, the food from the Pacific, the food from Scotland, although you could argue haggis is not something you want to celebrate too much. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's wrong with a sheep stomach, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I was able to celebrate the good and the bad about both sides of my mum's, mum and dad's culture or heritage. Um, so I went back through the history, not just about my mum and dad, but what was going on in all those times when my mum and dad grew up, because they passed that on to me. Um, just quickly, just quickly, a classic little, uh, if some people think they don't have a culture, particularly if they're from a European or the dominant culture, yeah. you do. What do you do when you celebrate birthdays? My mother came from, came from Samoa, and Samoans don't generally celebrate birthdays. We have big celebrations for funerals, for weddings, things like that, but birthdays we don't actually celebrate much. So she never really was, when she had us in New Zealand, what do you do on birthdays? And so she actually had to learn how to make this thing with flour and sugar, and you put it into a bowl, uh, into a tin, you put it in the oven, this thing raises up, 
you bring it out, you put this funny sort of syrupy, sugary thing on it, and then these waxy sticks, and you put it in a put it in a cake, and you light, and you light it. And then everyone sings a song that everyone knows. <laughs> well, maybe not everyone does know, it. <laughs> but some, most people do. Yeah, like, yeah. no one ever sat me down to say this is actually how you sing Happy Birthday. That's right. You just know and. <laughs> Culture, remember, is just the things that you do around here. That's what culture is. Mm. And so birthday cakes were quite foreign to my mother's side of the family. But to my dad's side of the family, they were normal. So to say you don't have a culture, uh, I'm not sure about that, because that's a cultural protocol that goes on at pretty much most, most birthdays across Australia. Yeah. So that was, that was passed down through family. So blood. So blood. There you go. There's one. So explore your heritage. And, and and I think that's a, a really important one for for people to do. And I I ask the same questions in in the classes that I've run. Uh, uh, where, where are you from? Where, what, what's your background? Yeah. And uh, you, you know, I'm I'm about as white as a white guy can be. If I was any less white, I'd be clear. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I had to think about this stuff for for my own self and it wasn't until uh i was doing a, a project uh with uh one of my daughters who w- was starting to look at her cultural tale for school and um uh, w- was asking you know w- how did how did we come to australia how, how was how how did that all happen for for our family yeah. that we started to to have a look at that and we were we right. were convicts first fleeters and uh we ended up at norfolk island uh and uh, from there, uh, went to Tassie, spent spent some time in Tassie uh, a few generations later, and then um, came to came to the mainland uh, after yeah. island hopping for for a few generations, and it it started for me a process of thinking through what that means mm. for who I am now. Uh, and, and where where I've come to, and and you're right. Uh, I love a Sunday roast. That's that's kind of my that cultural thing. I I love a, a roast on a Sunday. But where does that come from? Um, it, totally. it, you know, uh, it, it's it's very much that kind of um, English colonial thing that yep. I had just always loved. Yeah. Not totally. realised that that was part of my culture. Um, yep. Exactly. So yeah, very much. We we all have culture. We've just got to scratch the surface. Right. Totally. And actually, a part of just uh, just finish on the blood and move on to the next bit. Actually, a part of um, owning the idea that you have a culture, particularly if it, you, know, you, find, you start claiming roasts as a part of your culture, Aaron, which I love. Yep. You know, and Samoans have adopted that, by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so you should. <laughs> exactly. So, there you go. so, but if you can actually start to own those things that are seen as, as normal or yeah. what is done around here and actually say they're part of your culture, if you do realize what you're doing there is actually starting to decolonize yourself. Mm. You're actually saying that actually, uh, yeah, yes, this is the way things are done here. This is how I do it. By saying this is how I do it, you then possibly open up the question of, well, how do you do it? Mm. As soon as you actually then recognize that there's someone else in the room, or there's another way of celebrating the same thing. Everyone has birthdays. We've all been born. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter which part of the world you're in, but every part of the world will celebrate that thing differently. So as soon as you can say, I celebrate this this way, how do you celebrate it? You are actually opening a dialogue. You are opening a space in between for a dignifying exchange, I think, or an empathetic mm. exchange. So as soon as you can own something that's yours and say, okay, yes, I, I, that's my culture. And we want you in Mahana to own the things that give you life, not the things that don't yep. drain you. So, but we still want you to look at the things that drain you. <laughs> so, you know, they're draining you. Yes. Um, so it's because you want to be conscious to those things. Uh, if you can own it, then you've got something to give. You've got something to share. And in my understanding as a youth worker of 20, 25 years, I want to give. I mm. want young people and people to have the best possible outcome in their life. And that often comes from what we give yes. as youth workers. So if we can offer not just our empathy, but also our culture, oh my God, how good a, you know, that's and, a huge best of the package. You know? and, and offer the opportunity to share culture. Bingo. Not, yeah. not just to give them our culture, which yes. is very much colonizing, 
yeah. but That's to right. to share and to find out about each other's yeah. cultures. Yeah. That's right. There's a term in CQ and cultural intelligence we call the assumption of normality. Yes. And, uh, that's a dangerous thing to be in, the assumption of normality. Mm. Anyway, move on. So the next one, we've got blood. So we've done that. Go away and explore your parents' cultural tale, their heritage, mm. and go back as far as you can, not just to your grandparents, but even further if you can. Yeah. Find out the historic. Get curious about history. That's se seven generations. Yeah, seven oh. generations. If we want to use the Native American yeah. form, let's do that. The next one is birth. And that's literally where you're born and the time you're born. So my mm. mother was born in Samoa. My grandparents were born in Scotland, but I was born in New Zealand. And they're not the same place. They're not? <laughs> they're different places. <laughs> so that place will have an influence. Um, and so New Zealand, or Aotearoa, actually had a massive influence on, my, on me. You know, I ate pineapple lumps. The All Blacks, you know, I cry every time I see the haka. You know, all those sort of things. They're very Kiwi. Yep. And so that was a massive influence. So that is different to those other places. So I want to celebrate that as well. Um, so what is particularly Kiwi? You know, that's New Zealand. And mm -hmm. so Māori culture has influenced me. Kiwiana, as we use it, caught that term over there, uh, around the sort of modern uh, Pākehā culture or white culture mm -hmm. is also a part of who I am. Um, and I was born, I was a, it's also context, when you were born. I was born in the late 60s, but I'm an 80s kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I grew up watching, you know, I don't know, um, you know, well, not, what's pre-Friends, things like uh, Happy Days, all those kind of TV yeah, shows. You know, family so, Ties. Family Ties, you got it. Those kind yeah. of shows. I can't believe I've forgotten it. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, New Romantics Music, U2, those kind of, they were my, they, when I was, you know, young, the young people's age that we're working yeah. with, that was my culture. And, I, and I, I want to celebrate that. I don't want someone to say, oh, your culture isn't U2 or Bono, because it was. Yeah. <laughs> So we celebrate the context that you were born into, but also physically the land, if it's different to where your heritage is from, they need to be celebrated as well. So that's your birth. So don't be afraid of that or mm. don't diminish it. Because I mean, anything you, if you are told to forget something or not to celebrate, you're diminishing your dignity. Mm. So by celebrating something, you're actually going, yeah, okay. And I want to see, as you would know, Aaron, if you look at a kid and they start doing this, they're at risk. Mm. But if they start doing this, not like puffing up and being arrogant, but actually this is who I am, then, you know, you've got a chance with that kid, you know? Sure. If, if, so if they, can be, if they can actually be proud of the context they came from, then we've got a chance. Yeah, that's yep. a platform for resilience. So we've got blood and we've got birth. And, so birth and, place, and that, birth, that birth stuff is, is one that we talk about a lot in youth work, mm. you know, the, the, who, who are you? Where, where did you come from? Kind of yeah. stuff. What's your, what's your, what's your family dynamics, your background, all that type of thing. If you've ever done a genogram or yeah. Um, yeah. an eco map or anything like that, you, you have started to pick away at some of these, these questions. And um, I, I, I'm a child of, of the eighties, early nineties as, as well. I, I was born in 82 and uh, in Melbourne, uh, in the Northern suburbs of Melbourne, actually the hospital that I was born at was a, a maternity hospital in Ivanhoe in the, in the, uh, in the northern suburbs and uh shortly after i was born it became a geriatric hospital uh so uh, the 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 uh little line was always that i was born there i'll die there as well so uh most of my uh growing up time if you like was in that kind of um northern suburbs in that kind of west ivanhoe west heidelberg space and um and the time is a really interesting one too uh uh being a child of the the 80s uh we we fit in that um in that gen x millennial space mm. uh, i hate those those terms yeah. but that's yeah. the the bit that we we yeah. kind of fit in uh we're often called the 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 last of the ones that the parents would allow out in the streets to go and cause trouble but we're also the first that were really tech savvy and started yeah. to to do all that tech stuff so we i fit in that kind of space there and and mm. I'm just as comfortable going out and causing mischief out on the streets as I am sitting behind a computer and mm. playing PlayStation um, uh, yeah. because of the time. 
yeah. that I was yeah. born. Um, I, I was uh, in uh, grade prep, uh, our first uh, uh, foot into the door of schooling on the bicentenary, uh, 1988. Uh, so we got all those, uh, for those of you who were there, a little coin commemorating 200 years of Australia. <laughs> a laughable idea now to me, yeah, but uh, there, there we yeah. are, two, 200 years of, uh, of yeah. um, colonization and yeah. uh, we yeah. celebrated it. And I remember as a kid thinking, this is amazing, 200 years, woo! Yeah. Yeah. All of these things played a part of uh right. my my birth where and when yeah and uh, when. yeah and the other one just within the birth one is actually your orientation hmm. so your sexual orientation even even possibly the faith or religion you've been born into yeah great. who your parents have chosen so those things need to be brought into a place your orientation around all sorts of things like whether it's your sexual orientation whether it's ability or disability whoever mm. you want to call that yeah. what you were born how you were born actually has a culture because it has behaviors and ways of doing things that have come out of that orientation that you need to celebrate, that we need to actually say, yes, let's have a look at that and actually go, yes, that's who I am. And that yeah. has a culture. And, and so, it, so that's another part of the birth part is actually looking at, you know, your context, the place you're born in, but actually how, how were you born? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you born a male, born a female, or whatever your yeah. sexual orientation is, they all have certain uh, cultures attached to that. And we need to celebrate that. And, and you know, whether you accept or reject the, yeah. the stuff that you're born with, uh, you know, uh, and, and I think uh, re religion is one of those ones that we, we don't talk a, a lot about in, in Australia anymore. Uh, it's seen as a bit taboo, but um you know only a few generations ago you you were probably born into a fairly conservative christian environment uh yeah. your your parents probably went to church their parents probably went to church that their parents parents probably went to church and so the expectation was that that you wouldn't uh i know growing up my father very much rejected that idea wouldn't come to church wouldn't go to church at all um, for, for a number of reasons that he um, made his own culture and so mm. when as a an early 20s uh, guy I decided to start going to church we had a, a, a cultural rift there because mm. yeah. he'd rejected that part of his cultural tale and I'd accepted mm -hmm. that part of yeah, a cultural it. tale there you go yeah so if it, it's worth it's worth shedding light on those ones and actually mm. going what, look at those. So for example, some of the kids you may be working with come from Muslim or Buddhist backgrounds. Mm. So and that's very strong. So if we're not willing to actually look at possibly our own religious tale, mm -hmm. um, that's either we've rejected or we have accepted or actually have influenced us, then why why do we why do we engage with someone else mm. if it's really important to our muslim young people their, their islam islamic faith then if we don't actually want to show dignity maybe not to ours but to others then that relationship is fraught as far as mm. i'm concerned so we need to celebrate all of this is about celebration yeah. So the last one, we'll move on to the last one because I know we've got time here, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah, like to go on for it. You know, that's all right. We <laughs> we we can split it into two parts. Um, the last the last one of our sort of tr uh, 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 tr trinity threads, I suppose, the triple threads of our cultural mm -hmm. tale. If you want to think about that, is choice. So the choices we make. So for me personally, I was like I said, I was born to a Scottish and Samoan uh, mum and dad. I was born in Aotearoa in New Zealand in the 80s oh, as a child of the 80s even though i was born in the 60s but the 80s yeah. are what's, in, what's really um influenced me uh, yeah. heterosexual male those things that i was born in. but i chose to live here in melbourne in 1995 i moved here to australia didn't know anything about tim tams never heard of michael lunig uh, <laughs> never watched footy <laughs> the oval ball game to me was rugby um yeah. And soccer was my main game, but I came here and I've fallen in love with Melbourne. I live yep. in Ascot Vale, um, on the land of Wurundjeri people, close to the Maribyrnong River and to the Yuyangs, um, and know that you know uh, uh, generations, thousands of generations of Indigenous people have lived on the land that I've lived on. 
um, and I've got to know their story as much as I can. And now I've got to know Melbourne and Melbourne's mm. a place I love. Um, and I live in the inner West. So I live in Ascot Vale uh, where coffee is huge and good food is good. Mm. Um, well, it's important. So how I do things in Ascot Vale is probably really different to how people do things in Frankston or out in Blackburn. Although, although coffee is always <laughs> important. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Coffee is important. <laughs> and it's become a competitive thing. Why would say Ascot Vale there's better coffee than anywhere else? But anyway, <laughs> but I've chosen to live here in Melbourne and I've chosen to live here in Ascot Vale. And there are stories and, and a culture of those places that I embrace. My wife is Australian, seventh generation, true fair dinkum Aussie. Yep. Uh, born here, but brought up in Tassie. Um, and so I've married into Australia. So I've chosen that. That's my choice. I've chosen to live here. No one forced me to be here. Yep. Um, and I choose to dignify those tales. Um, and so uh, I've, got, I've made myself very local. And Ascot Vale is my home, um, mm. which is situated in Melbourne and situated in the vast, vast, vast you know, bigger country of Australia. So I've chosen all of those places to celebrate. Um, and get to know and add to my story. Um, so uh, the, the, the tale has three threads for us that we explore. So when, when I actually introduce myself, I try not to make it quite as long as this, but I literally say, yes, I drag many cultural tales, yep. not just one. And I will go through five or six of them and say, this is actually um, you know, who I am. Mm -hmm. And this is who stands in front of you. Um, and so we don't tend to say where you're from now, Aaron, as my hard people. We say, where are you local? Where are you local? Yeah. And, and actually, we can be local in many places. So when I go back to New Zealand to visit my father, which I do two or three times a year, how I operate there is very different to how I operate here. So I'm local there too. And you can only be local if you know the story of local. Mm. So when we say... Uh, where are you local? We're actually asking you, tell me many places where you know how to be in those places. Culture is basically about how do I know to be and to operate and to behave. Mm -hmm. If you know how to do that in a place, then actually you're, you're culturally literate or yes. culturally competent um, because you know the story. But for us, cultural intelligence starts with your own cultural story. If you can actually start to develop that, understand it, engage with it, good and bad, then we can actually then become culturally aware, uh, culturally responsive um, and, and culturally confident. We have already, just quickly, I'll just, just, and when we talk about cultural intelligence, cultural intelligence for us uh, in the Pacific, uh, the ocean is our biggest part of the earth, yeah? For Aboriginal mm -hmm. Australians, it's land. It's the red earth, you know, that mm -hmm. you touch. That's their, that's their, who they are, who they're connected to. For us, it's the ocean in the Pacific. You know, it's only 1%. The, the South Pacific uh, continent is actually the largest continent on the planet. And that's how we see it. We come from the largest continent on the world. Us yep. Polynesia. <laughs> it, cause it's, cause it's water that we see is our biggest part. So water is really important to us. So it's our way of kind of making sense of the world. So cultural intelligence for us is being able to see the water that you're swimming in and actually realize you are swimming in water. Yep. Culture, obviously, sometimes you don't even know you're in it. Cultural intelligence is the ability to open your eyes and actually see you're, you're surrounded by another substance that you're swimming around in. Mm -hmm. Actually opening your eyes, awakening yourself to how things are done and what brought me here and what story do I bring. Cultural awareness is actually understanding that there are other currents in the water. There are other currents deep down that other people are wandering around in. And actually, not only that, I'm culturally aware of my current or the currents that I've been, I'm swimming in and being dragged along. Cultural responsive practice for us is knowing how to swim gently, safely in those other people's currents. Mm. So that when you're in those currents, you're responding with dignity and with care and curiosity and nurture so that people can grow. So we use the water as a bit of a metaphor to understand CQ, cultural awareness and cultural responsive practice. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, it, it's, it's a framework that is very easy to understand. Yeah. Blood, birth and choice. Uh, that, that, that heritage, that blood of, of where have we come from? What, what have the generations be, uh, before us uh, 
led into us what, what what's in our blood what's what's coursing through our veins the yep. the history the background the heritage um the the good the bad and the ugly uh, yep. of that Absolutely. and and i think it's easy for us to see the good and take on those good things but we do need to think about the the, the bad as well because that has yep. had an impact on yeah, can I just can I just you pointed to one you alluded to one really well there, Aaron. When you yep. said that, you know the two hundred years of celebrating, you know mm. Australia, and you, and when you were a child, you were actually celebrating that. For but sure, I, I know you well, and actually now I'm not yeah. sure whether you would celebrate that. No, you've not, that, not at you've all. You've been on that journey, and yeah. that's what, that's the journey we've got to face. And and, and that's been part of my choice. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and you know I, I think about that that. Well, I'll come back to choice, but the, the birth yeah, yeah. stuff, um, when we were born, where all that type of stuff and, and the, that time of when we were born being a really important thing. And, and I think um, I, I look at my, my dad's generation and, and the generation before him, the, the, the idea of reconciliation wasn't even a, a blip on the radar really no. um it, it it was it was so small but then you know we had um uh paul keating and and the redfern address we've had um other prime ministers talking about this stuff it's become as something that as australians we talk mm. about whether we agree with it or not um it, it's being talked about it wasn't talked about a generation or two ago um so time is a really important thing to think about as as i said 1988 grade prep getting a coin to celebrate the fact that australia was 200 years old i thought that was amazing as, as a kid now as a as a late 30s i'm like Mm, that was just another step in colonializing right. Australia. Yeah. Um, and, and that then leads to that choice discussion of what do we choose? Uh, what do we take on board? And, you, you know, um, I, I grew up in that kind of inner northern suburbs of, of Melbourne, uh, Ivanhoe, West Heidelberg area. Uh, I've slowly moved further north. I'm, I'm right up near Whittlesea these days. Uh, I've chosen to live further away from the city, to be closer to land. And, and, and um, uh, particularly for me, the, the Mount Disappointment State Forest area it is really, um, it's a place of, of, um, of culture, if you like, for me. It's a place to get back to, to the roots of, of who I am. Um, but I've chosen to, to live away from the city when actually most of my work has been very much city centric. Mm -hmm. um, I've chosen to have a, a, a large family these days. I have, uh, I have five children. Um, uh, you know, th these things of choice uh, of, of who we are as people, uh, our culture is such a, uh, such a, it's an important step to, to see that we've actually chosen these things rather than it just being a, a, a whim or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Totally. That's empowering. That's part of our independence. So for me, just to finish up with on that point, Aaron, yes. we thought we'd talk about why is this important for young people. Um, if, if most of our work is actually helping young people, uh, broken relationships, find out who they are, then exploring your cultural tale is a part of that kind of healing, if you want to use that term, mm -hmm. or resilience or reconstruction or recon reclaiming, um, becoming a citizen in our world. Um, you need to know all, the sto all your stories, I think. Um, and so, but I do need to say that it's hard work. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not something, just because we've gone blood, birth, choice, it, they, all, the, all the ducks are gonna line up and everything's perfect. I mean, if you do your own, this is what we say, if you do your own exploration, your own connection, your own reconnection and re-engaging of your cultural tale yourself, then you can ask someone else to do that. Yes. And ask a young person to do that. And actually, it's a really cool way, and I've done this with some younger people, is actually we explore it together. This is what my tale says. Tell me those. And actually, how do we explore? And quite often, young people will go, because when they say culture, they often just think, oh, my parents' blood, I don't have parents. Yep. A lot of the kids I used to work with, bro, were, um, were on intervention orders or yep. with care and protection. They were taken from their parents. So they don't want to know anything about their blood. Yep. Why would they want to know about their mum and dad? 
because they were abusive or they disappeared. Yep. So when you say culture, they'll go, ah. if you say culture is only about blood, of course they're going to switch off. But if you can say culture is about the, 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 um, the, the music they listen to or the computer games they play with yep. or the places that they hang out, um, you know, or the choices they've made and actually celebrate those, the good ones, <laughs> um, then if you make culture that, then they may actually see it as a possible you know, platform to bounce back. Yeah. A resiliency tool. So you've got to broaden it. And that's why I like the idea of blood birth choice. And actually, even blood, even if they don't know their parents or the parents' stuff hasn't been great, if they go back a few generations, if they know whether they're possibly from Croatia or they're from Poland, you can talk about the history of Poland and Croatia. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go directly to mum and dad because yeah. if you use the seven generations, you can see how they have been influenced. And so you might it might be a more better way of actually engaging. So I think this, if you decide to think this is actually a really good way of engaging with your young people, just the little caution and warning from me, it's, it's long and it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would argue we never finish. No, no, we don't. It, 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 it's, uh, it's not a tale that has the end at the end of it. No. it it's, it's a tale that uh, has to be continued. And that's, uh, where we, that's where we come back to the first one. Uncle Martin, Uncle Martin says, look back seven generations, look where the present is, then what's future. So if you look yeah. at what it is, blood, blood birth, choice, you yes. can see how there's actually those three going on, past, yes. present, future. So yeah. because our stories will live on beyond us through your kids, Aaron, the yes. next generations, your stories will be carried on. But if you don't own them, and actually engage with them, give them dignity. How can you pass them on? Yeah. You actually, you actually chop the tail by doing that. And actually, just I'll finish with this point. Lots of people have come to us and, and said, um, "Well, we don't have a culture. You know, I don't, I don't know where to start." And I've often said, "You start it. Mm. You start the culture. You start it now." So if you sit around your table with your kids and you eat a roast every Sunday, say to them, "This is what we do in our mm. culture, kids." This is our tradition. This, this is, is our tradition. Need. And yeah. if it's a good thing, if it's a good act or good behavior that gives life to your family or mm. to your to your friends, then name it as your culture. Yes. Because you can start it now mm. for the next generations. That's what I love about the idea of cultural tale. And and that's that's a really great spot to to finish on, Greg. Thank you so much for for taking the time and, and talking to us about these things, blood, birth, choice. Um, cultural intelligence is very much something we need to uh, wrestle with yeah. as youth workers, not just um, for ourselves, but for, for our young people. If yeah. we can have some understanding of what this means for ourselves, um, then we can help young people to yeah. Um, yep. digest it and journey with this because yep. um, it, it helps us to become much more rounded people uh, than just EQ, IQ. We need to be able to be open to having some curiosity about others as well. Yep. Thank you so much, Greg. You're welcome. Thanks for having us, Aaron. Pleasure. Take care. Take care.